Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tom Sharpley, and I'm the assistant manager here at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And I would like to introduce our speaker this afternoon, whose name is Mr. Paul Gillis, and he is the author of The Law of the Hills, A Judicial History of Vermont. And we had six copies to sell, and we're all sold out. But if you want to buy one, you can give your name to John Devineau, and he's going to order some, and they'll be sent here, and we'll contact you when they come in. So we're sorry we, didn't have, we don't have more. Um, Mr. Paul Gillis is a lawyer, historian, author, and partner in the law firm Talent, Tarrant, Gillis, and Richardson. He's the co-founder of the Vermont Judicial Hist History Society and the Vermont Institute for Government. He's the former Vermont Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State and currently moderator for the town of Berlin. Uh, he's the author of numerous books, including Uncommon Law, Ancient Roads, and Other Ruminations of Vermont Legal History, and he's just published this book, which I've told you about. So we have to thank the Vermont Federal Credit Union, and we have to thank uh, 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 Channel 17, who is uh, taping this program. And now I'd like to, without, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mr. Paul Gillis. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. I'm delighted to be invited to talk about my favorite subject. But, you know, when we start uh, these sessions, we have to bow to our uh, host, uh, Ethan Allen. And I think it's important that you recognize how important he was to the founding of Vermont and, and his role in some classic uh, cases. He was, uh, first of all, <coughs> he gives his name or his Lines gives it to the, to the uh, title of the book. In uh, the first and per perhaps most important Vermont case, wasn't held in Vermont, it was held in Albany. It was before there was a Vermont, it was in 1770. Uh, somehow, uh, Ethan had put himself in a position where Vermont decided he could be our attorney, even though he wasn't an attorney, and he went to the trial, and at the trial, the judge when offered a copy of the New York, of the uh, New Hampshire Charter as evidence, rejected it and said it was irrelevant. It had nothing to do with the case. We were talking about New York patents and uh, there was no authority for uh, New York to, uh, for New Hampshire to be involved in a New York court. Vermont at that time was regarded as New York. And uh, so Ethan then did what probably many do after they've lost a lawsuit. He went to the tavern and uh, he ran into the Attorney General of New York. And the Attorney General first decided to make him, he said, we can work this out. How about if I, we give you a thousand acres and make you the king of Vermont? And he said, uh, no, 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 no. And uh, so then the Attorney General leaned into him and said, you know, might makes right. And uh, Ethan responded by saying, well, you know, the gods of the valleys are not the gods of the hills, which was a sort of recognition that there might be some other jurisdiction involved. That's a line from the Book of Kings, although it's inverted, the, and uh, for some reason, I, I was thinking about why he inverted it, because it's the gods of the hills, not the gods of the valleys, but he was talking from the valley. Uh, so he went home, well, the Attorney General said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, why don't you come on up and we'll show you. Uh, and uh, the Attorney General did not come up, but uh, Ethan Allen was enraged, went home, formed the Green Mountain Boys, and created the independence movement, which led to Vermont. Uh, so Ethan is, uh, is critical there, and I've called this the law of the hills, is sort of off, off pulling off for that. He was, uh, he appeared, well, you remember, uh, five years later, he led the Green Mountain Boys to take Ticonderoga, much to the surprise of everyone, including the Continental Congress. And uh, then he made a, Ill and then he took uh, uh, another, uh, you know, for another fort up the, up the, down the lake, I guess you'd say. And then he made a furtive attempt to conquer Canada with too few people and most of them were sick and he was arrested and he spent that next year in uh, uh, chains in, uh, in uh, Europe or in Dublin, I guess. Uh, but when he came back, he was, 
He had made a promise he wouldn't participate in the, in the uh, war, but he made a, uh, he did start moving things around. Actually, when he, before he took uh, Ticonderoga, there was a lot of uh, little skirmishes, and there was a man named Benjamin Spencer who lived in Castleton, uh, who incidentally had a dog named Tryon, and that was uh, unfortunate. Uh, and Benjamin Spencer had accepted a job as, or an appointment as a, a, a ju justice of the peace under New York, and the Green Mountain Boys found that to be anathema. So they visited him in the nighttime. They took him out in his sleeping wear. They took him to another place. They had a quick trial. Uh, and then they said that they were going to punish him and uh, what, that they're going to punish him and he, what they're going to do is they're going to burn his house down. So they all tro trooped over to his house and then the, the wife came out and said, this is my family, this is, you know, we live here. So they changed their mind and decided to take the roof off. And they took the roof off and then the wife said, well, that's where we stored all our grain. That's, you know, it's the fall. We, what are we supposed to do? So they said, all right, well, if you promise to give up the office, uh, and then they put the roof back on and they left. So uh, this, part of this is an illustration of the way we use violence in Vermont, in early Vermont. There was only one person, I believe, who was a Tory who was killed as a result of it. A lot, sometimes they would tie you up and pull you up at the catamount tavern next to this moth-eaten catamount that was up there and leave you up there for a couple hours. Sometimes they would whip you with a beach seal, as they said. Uh, but unfortunately, at some point, the, uh, they did do damage to Tryon. They skinned him alive, and uh, so that, that was a little rough, I guess. Uh, now, uh, he had to, uh, uh, well, we're talking about Trials that made Vermont. So we, we're going to now go forward to a time without Ethan in, in uh, the spring of 1775 when the uh, independence movement is beginning to work its magic and they focus on the courthouse in Westminster, which is up on uh, what they call a courthouse hill. And the men decided that they were going to not have that court meet. That court was only going to be deciding debt, and debt would be going against them. There was no money. They could only, they had to pay their taxes uh, only after the legislature agreed in uh, goods and services. So they tried to stop the court. Um, the sheriff, New York sheriff, and his men was, were liquored up, and there was a collision, and one man was killed, and one man died later. And, it, and the, the New York courts never met in Vermont again after that. It was, it was such a, a big thing that uh, it ended, essentially, New York rule, although it took several years to work that out. <clears throat> Ethan wasn't involved in that, as I said. But he was involved in 1778 in the uh, murder trial of uh, David Redding, who was a uh, British spy, they said. And he was tried by the Supreme Court in Bennington. Uh, the courthouse was up where, near where the monument is now. He was uh, tried by a jury of six, and a man named John Burnham called the lawyer, but never really had anything other than a battered copy of Blackstone, came forward and said, it says here that the, you know, you have to have a jury of 12. And Ethan was there, and there was also a mob ready to see the hanging. And uh, so Ethan came out and stood on a stump and said, uh, sorry, no hanging today. Come back in a week and you'll see a hanging. And if it isn't David Redding, you can hang me, which is a, an Allen-esque thing to say, I guess. Uh, and uh, also the Supreme Court came out with an issue that uh, intimated that they would try it next year, next week, and he would be found guilty. There's a certain amount of less respect for impartiality at, at that point. Uh, so uh, then there was the trial of, uh, in May of 1779, of 36 uh, Vermonters who were favoring New York. And they had been accused of inimical conduct and opposing the authority of the state. Um, some of them were uh, young men and some of them were what they they were organized to oppose Vermont, uh, 
But again, uh, a wily lawyer, Stephen Rowe Bradley, our first lawyer, who also was clerk of the court at the time, there wasn't enough lawyers to go around, uh, managed to persuade the court to, to dismiss the case because the Constitution at the time said that no law would be effective until it had been published in the, not that there were no Vermont uh, newspapers that would do it, so the Connecticut Current would do it. And they, he showed that it hadn't been published, so they let them go. And Ethan jumped up and he said, I, I would have the young gentleman, pointing to Bradley, to know that my logic and reasoning from the eternal fitness of things, I can upset his black stones, his white stones, his gravestones, and his brimstones. And the chief judge then asked uh, him to remove his hat <laughs> and his sword. And he see, I said, I see, however, that some of them, by the quirks of this artful lawyer Bradley, are escaping from the punishment they so richly deserve. Let me warn your honor to be on your guard, lest these delinquents should slip through your fingers and thus escape the rewards so justly do their crimes. Uh, then he hired Bradley as his lawyer. Um, he, uh, Bradley was once asked to defend a Green Mountain boy whose musket was seized for a debt in 1779. And a letter, Alan, to Bradley said, charge it to me, my warriors must not be cheated out of their firearms. Um, so, oh, by the way, David Redding, uh, John Spargo, the uh, uh, Bennington Museum uh, director and uh, uh, quite a, an interesting historian, wrote a book in the 30s and said, Redding was not a spy, you can hang a spy. He was a military officer and he, there was no way to charge him with murder and that was a mistake, but it was too late at that point. All right, so we've done our obeisance to Ethan Allen. Let me talk about history. And in the li eyes of the law, we need to answer what is history. And I've written this in the beginning of the biographical section. History is hearsay, admissible when found in documents in existence 20 years or more, whose authenticity is established and relied on, even though the historian has no means of acquiring personal knowledge of the matter stated, admissible, but not always reliable, reliable because it is often all we have to rely on and because it fits. This evidence should be given the weight it deserves. Whenever I heard that when I was practicing, it sounded as though the judge was balling it up and throwing it away. But uh, some stories may be invented, and many are doubtlessly enhanced by memory, but they are also too charming to dismiss. I have, was not around with Ethan Allen or the beginning of the court, so what I rely on is basic documents that I can find in the record that have been published and the court cases themselves. And it is a sparse record to begin with, but I've tried to put it together in a way that makes sense. When you go to write something as large as 241 years of history, you're gonna leave some things out, and you're gonna to have to make some hard choices. And uh, exactly what you leave in and what you leave out is uh, completely uh, my choice, <laughs> I say. I found what I thought were the leading cases, I found the leading incidents that I thought were important. Um, but what I'm left with and what you'll see in the book is a kind of pizzicato approach to history. It's, it, it, somebody said, I, I like your book because you can pick it up anywhere, open it up and then put it down and come back later and do something else. Um, but we have, so, I, so the chapters involve the people who served on the court, both their quirks and their strengths. Uh, we have, uh, of those, I think uh, I would note that uh, one of the problems over the years was that we were killing our judges by the rigor with which we made them move around the state. They had to move oftentimes a week at a time over bad roads. Uh, and uh, of, of, the, of the 134 men and women that were on the court, 12 died in office, including four chief justices, um, many of them in their 70s, but still. Um, we had, uh, and there were curious people. Russell Taft, who is pro the last person other than uh, Judge Fresh, Frank Fish to write about Vermont's uh, judicial history, uh, believed sincerely that citing case law from other states 
w was irrelevant. It was like that uh, New Hampshire charter in, the, in, in Albany. Um, in, Titus Hutchinson uh, was a great writer and a great chief justice, but he was bounced because of two things. One, it was said he wrote too many opinions. And the reason was that in the legislature got a concern that the, the uh, judges on the Supreme Court weren't doing their fair share, so they said everyone will get the same pay for the same number of opinions. And then one of the judges got sick and t Hutchinson ended up writing his decisions for him. And that was charged as fraud and they even talked about suing the widow of this former justice for the money that he had collected. But the other problem was the uh, uh, way that Hutchinson handled the murder uh, conviction of uh, Cleveland. Uh, and Cleveland had, was a physician from uh, Newport and uh, he had uh, a relationship with a, a young woman and she became pregnant and he decided to try an abortion and he botched it and she died. So he was tried for murder and convicted and sentenced to be hanged. Um, and he applied an appeal to the Supreme Court and the, uh, uh, Hutchinson denied the appeal or delayed, he asked, he appealed and then he wanted it to be heard before it was hanged. And uh, Hutchinson said no, which would have made it somewhat irrelevant as to whether they heard his case or not. And in the meantime, the legislature got involved and commuted his uh, sentence to five years in state prison, which given the reports on what the state prison was like, might have been worse than being hanged. <laughs> One of our judges was actually a Tory until he converted by taking a, a a uh, oath of off, uh, oath of allegiance to Vermont, and, but still, when we came around to paying off the New York debt and paying the people who uh, claimed that they had a, a New York land that weren't, wasn't being compensated, he received part of the thirty thousand uh, dollars that uh, Vermont had to pay New York. And uh, uh, Charles K. Williams, one of my favorite writers on the court, uh, was said to have smiled but twice in his 19 years on the court. Uh, 54 of the judges and justices were native to Vermont and Connecticut had the most of the others. Uh, I started getting crazy so I listed that uh, 20 had beards, 7 mustaches and 3 had serious sideburns. And uh, the, if you look, I'm most proud of the appendix where you have, I've tried to get a picture of every judge that I could, and I think I've got 129 of the 134, but you will notice that uh, their faces include few smiles and many haunted looks suggesting exhaustion, ferocity, and sanguinity. Uh, now the judges were elected by the legislature until 1974, and after that by a process involving the Judicial Nominating Committee, checking on the people who were uh, who wanted to be judges. Uh, the legislature changed the law last year to requiring that they put forward qualified candidates and now they require them to put forward highly qualified candidates. I don't know if that makes a difference or not. Um, but uh, if, uh, Harvey Otterman, a, 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 a recently passed away uh, uh, attorney, longtime attorney from Orange County who once told me he was the only attorney between St. Johnsbury and White River in his time, wrote his memoirs, and he was indignant that the 1974 amendments to the Constitution that allowed this appointive process to work had taken away the power of the court from the people and given it to the judges and the lawyers, and he was perfectly disgusted by that. Um, I'll, I have to mention, uh, Loveland Munson, he was one of the, he had wonderful sideburns way out to here. And he was conspicuously a commoner and so intense was his regard for the common and accustomed things and so averse to new things that he opposed wearing a robe while on the bench and only until after he had retired did the court sta start wearing them. <coughs> and we have uh, Homer Royce who was uh, chief in the 19th century who as part of his duties on the Supreme Court conducted murder trials, 
and is said to have sentenced prisoners in terms so tender and pathetic that they sometimes overwhelmed him with thanks. And others, uh, other judges uh, in, the, in history have been ranked by how fast or slow they were at handling trials, how kind and severe their demeanor, and how they compared in their opinion writing. So we have, uh, I think it's important to note that uh, law school is a relatively recent requirement, that out of the 134 men and women who served on the Supreme Court since 1778, only 40 attended law school, although 70 of the 134 attended college. LaForest Thompson of Irisburg served on the Supreme Court from 1890 to 1900, attended no law school or college, didn't even read law in a lawyer's office. He was entirely self-taught. And Luke P. Poland, one of our great justices, attended school for only five months at Jericho Academy before going to work on a, in a store clerk and later as a teacher. And he says, well, he did read law in, the, uh, in a lawyer's office, but he used to say he was educated in a sawmill. Uh, on the first uh, generation of Vermont judges weren't, law weren't attorneys. There, there weren't many around anyway. Eighteen of the first had some other occupation. There were three physicians, two clergymen, several farmers. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, we had, uh, well, this is what Frank Fish said. There's a, if there are people that preceded me, Frank Fish was a superior judge. Uh, who wrote a bio the biographies of all the judges in the Supreme Court up to 1926. And just after he finished this remarkable thing, he was appointed to the Supreme Court, and shortly after, after that he died. Uh, but, so he's one of my heroes, and he said that in the situation in which the fathers found themselves, they did their best they could in the selection of judges. They wanted courts, and to this end, organize counties. And these courts, they enjoyed uh, they enjoyed their confidence and respect. There were no lawyers to fill the places on the bench when they were first created except lawyers of the crown. I think it's interesting that uh, we had these uh, folks that were serving. Uh, I'm thinking today that the Supreme Court is at some point exclusive. I mean, you can't go up there and play cards. You can't have lunch, you, except in very special circumstances. But I was reading this morning that in 1792, Isaac Titchener, who was later governor, but was on the Supreme Court, I think he might have been chief judge, had a disagreement with Ira Allen over whether Ira Allen owed the state money at the end of his term as state treasurer. And uh, for some reason, Allen blamed Titchener for the accusation that he was a crook and told him they were gonna fight a duel. And they, so they said, all right. And, uh, but dueling was against the law in Vermont, so they, they took the ferry to New Hampshire and in one early morning, five o'clock in the morning, they both presented themselves on the field, and then their friends came and took their guns away, and the dispute was not settled. <laughs> now, this is a common thing. What, one of my favorite stories is in the chapter on courthouses, and it takes place in 1822, when the uh, St. Albans Militia is doing its annual June training in the Green, where the Green is today, and the judge is in his chambers, or in his courtroom, <coughs> holding trial, and he says to the bailiff, what is that noise? And the bailiff says, well, that's our general, you know, and these guys are playing fifes and drum and shooting their muskets and their cannons and things. So he says, well, would you tell them to stop? I mean, go out there and tell them to stop. So, unfortunately, he ran into Captain Green, who didn't take that very well, and he said, you can go back in there and tell the judge that he has no power over military matters and just to you know, keep it to himself. Well, the judge didn't take this well, so he ordered the sheriff to go out and arrest the captain. And the captain didn't take that very well, so he ordered the militia to surround the courthouse with fixed bayonets. And then he stood at the door, sort of like Ethan Allen at the State House or, or at the Ticonderoga, and he said, if I'm not out in 15 minutes, take this building. Then he went in, they had a few words. The judge said, well, did you just keep it down? And he just didn't say he would. And then he went out and that, it was said that the young men in the militia then went to the store and bought more gunpowder and made more noise, but nothing else happened. And they happened to run into each other at the tavern that night. And the judge leaned down to Captain Green. He said, I maybe have gone a little too far. Let's forget the whole thing. <laughs> 
And thank goodness for L.L. L. Dutcher, the historian of St. Albans, who preserved the story. But you know that duel in New Hampshire and that take this building thing is exactly a, a paradigm. It's sort of like in 1786, a, a group of men calling themselves the regulators who were fed up with the courts captured the Vermont Supreme Court at the Rutland Courthouse and wouldn't let them go for two hours until they had a short meeting and decided, what are we doing? And they went home and let them go. And that's exactly the kind of situation. Now, you know, judicial history isn't as exciting as I've made it out to be, and you have to understand that I'm going to naturally pick out the exciting things because that's what you want to write about. But the day-to-day -day operation of the court and its decisions is, a, is also fascinating and worthy of attention. I think that you have, um, oh, I, well, I guess I could, say, oh, I, I just wanted to note that Vermont has served the nation well in, in uh, judges. Dorman Kent, who was the head of the Vermont Historical Society, wrote an interesting book in 1932 called Vermonters. And in that, he listed each town and then all the famous people he thought had been born there and come from there. And he listed 51 Vermont-born men who had served in judges, as judges, including 15 chief justices, in other states. And uh, he said that, well, he described their, ex he, he was on the committee, he was a great-grandson of Thomas Chittenden, and he was also assistant treasurer of the United States at the outbreak of the Civil War. And he was, uh, they had to, he had to, was assigned the task of signing the bonds to allow the money to be raised for the Civil War, just at the beginning. And he was a famous, uh, for, for seven days in a row, he hardly slept, he just kept signing those bonds until he grew so ill that he had to resign, and he had a palsied hand for the rest of his life. But <clears throat> he said that he, these candidates came to him for admission to the bar, and he just was appalled that they were so ignorant as so many hottentots, he said, although they had both spent, to these spent time in lawyers' offices, I frankly told him that for them to attempt to practice law would be wicked, dangerous, and would subject them to suits for malpractice. They begged, they prayed, they cried. They had been poor, had taught school to pay their way through college. And now they wanted to go west. They overcame my associates and I with much self-reproach, consented to sign their certificates, on condition that each would buy a copy of Blackstone, Kent's Commentaries, and Chitting Spleedings, and immediately migrate to some other town, <laughs> some other state. Um, you know, how do you get a picture of what the courts were like long ago? And there's a wonderful uh, early book uh, by Edward August Kendall, who visited uh, Rutland, uh, just as a tourist, I guess, and uh, and uh, he said, somebody said, well, you know, the court's going on in that building. So he, he went in there, and uh, the court was supposedly uh, considering a charge of counterfeiting bank bills. Uh, at my entrance, I saw through the dusk about 100 persons, shabbily dressed, standing, sitting, and reclining on the benches and tables. And from this apparent discord, I came to an instant conclusion that the court had adjourned. But after a few seconds, the words this honorable court had proceeded from the speaker, whose voice I had not at first distinguished, drew me over to a contrary opinion, and I believe that the honorable court was certainly to be found in some portion of the presence in which I stood. Accordingly, I set myself in all diligence to look for it, and as the principal group was assembled on what afterward I found to be uh, the right side of the bench, I first supposed it to be hidden there. I described descried upon the bench four or five men dressed like the rest, but differing in this, that they were bareheaded, while all the others wore their hats. From this particular, I was henceforth constantly able to distinguish the court from the rest of the persons who filled, from time to time, the bench." Um, I'd love that scene. I wish I had a drawing of this dark and musky place with him trying to discern who is the court. Uh, one courthouse was the scene of an execution. And this comes from uh, Newbury, which was at that time the Shire town 
of Orange County. Uh, you have heard of Molly's Pond and Joe's Pond over in that area. Well, they had a son named Tumalak, <coughs> and he was wild, and he had killed his first love by accident, attempting to kill her new husband, and then <laughs> the tribal hearing, Tumalak was found not guilty of murder and released, uh, because he wasn't trying to kill her, and, but later he killed another man with a knife, and for the second time, Tumalak was not held to liable for a death when the council heard that the other man made the first assault. But a third killing shortly thereafter was one too many, and this time there were no extenuating, circum extenuating circumstances. The council sentenced Tumalek to death. Uh, white settlers of the region generally allowed the Indian people to govern themselves, but the elders wanted some approval, the elders of the Indians wanted some approval of their actions. So they first visited Reverend Peter Powers, uh, who was the uh, ma uh, pastor at Newbury, and they asked him if the verdict was, if they were to execute Tumalek, that it would, if the verdict would be agreeable to the word of God. And he went home and prayed on it and said, he, yeah, he thought so, that was all right. And uh, then uh, they asked uh, the uh, judges of the court uh, if that would be all right, and they said, sure. And, so on the ground floor of the old county courthouse in Newfane, Tumalek was brought in. Uh, he was shot in the head by the father of the victim and buried in the yard outside the courthouse. And more than 200 years later, when they were fixing the, that uh, area, they dug his body up and they, that's how they knew that. Um, now there's other incidents, again, I'm focusing on these wonderfully rich stories, but it, it, again, that's not entirely a story. But the, uh, the uh, uh, Caledonia Courthouse was once in Danville, and that was a scene of the county's most notorious crime when Bristol Bill Warburton stabbed state's attorney Bliss Davis in the neck following his sentence in 1850. Bristol Bill was a bank robber who also dabbled in counterfeiting. His accomplished, Chris, Christian Meadows, was an excellent engraver. Warburton was sent to state prison, but Meadows was pardoned by the governor at the request of Daniel Webster to begin working for the U.S. Treasury Department because he was such a good engraver. Davis survived, and while Davis was recovering, Judge Luke P. Poland viol uh, visited his bedside and Davis said to him, I'm not dead yet, Judge, and you and I will live to punish a great many rascals yet. Uh, I don't know how many of these things you can take. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, there was, uh, oh, I, you know, there are stories. There's a wonderful story about the New York courts, and uh, the, uh, this, this is a story that's repeated time and time again, but now we're at February 25th, 1771, and the court, is somewhere to the west and is heading for Washington, which at that time was called Kingsland, to open the, the, the uh, term. Um, but uh, they left this report, uh, uh, so again, February. We set out from Moortown for Kingsland, traveled until night, there being no road, and the snow very deep. We traveled on snowshoes or rackets, rackets. On the 26th, we traveled some ways and held a council. When it was concluded, it was best to open the court as we saw no line that we were not in the right place, whether in Kingsland or not. But we concluded we were far in the woods. We did not expect to see any house unless we marched three miles within Kingsland and no one lived there when the court was ordered to be opened on the spot. So they recessed to the spring. Um, so uh, I think it's important to focus on not just personalities. I mean, the courts are more than personalities and they're more than courthouses. Uh, so I set out to write as many incidents as I could, many of the good stories, but also to include the leading cases and to give a sense of the direction of the uh, development of the court. And I think it's interesting to see how to compare the early court with the present court. In the early days, when we first had judges, say like the 
first time the court met in March of 1778, right after they had been appointed, Moses Robinson, Bob uh, Mello's wonderful book you should read to get a sense of him, uh, convened the court and there was the first divorce. Now today you wouldn't have a divorce heard as a trial before the Supreme Court, but there wasn't any court at the time and they did everything. So they inquired as to what the purpose was and the husband said his wife had strayed into adultery and uh, she didn't appear, so they accepted that. And then in the order of the court, they, they said, again, there's, they didn't even have the Blackstone book at that time, they didn't have any forms, there was no precedence, there was no formula. So they, the order says, what this court has put asunder, let no man put together. <laughs> and I think that's just brilliant. They took that marriage ceremony and they flipped it right upside down. Um, so we have uh, uh, these early days where we don't have any law, where we make it up as we go along, but we make it up reasonably and appropriately. We don't leave any trace because until 1822 we don't have any regular reported decisions, although we have a few judges who did some of uh, their own copies. And then we enter a period of uh, where the courts respond to change, the courts, every major event in Vermont's history becomes a court case of some sort, the uh, Prohibition Law of 1852, the, uh, all the way up through. And, uh, and then somewhere after 1850, when New York adopts the field code and, uh, and uh, books become more available, we start to see the Supreme Court citing New York, uh, or Massachusetts or New York courts, other than, of course, Russell Taft's view. And then we uh, eventually get to a point where we have uh, books of uh, commentary, which get to be cited, and we get uh, American Law Review, which is a, a, f a process of taking subjects and developing them, and uniform laws where the legislature adopts the law. Pretty soon we're, by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, the, the unique Vermont law is becoming unnecessary. We start to cleave toward a, a more universal view of the basic principles. And then, I could, this is, this is what you do is, you know, the arc of history, Ben Store Justice, well this is the, this is my arc. Uh, then in the 70s and uh, 80s and beyond, we have the court starting to find unique Vermont law in the Vermont Constitution. And uh, I was, there's a new book out that uh, talks about Vermont being the first state in the nation uh, in 1903 to reject the common law about whether uh, evidence that seized from uh, an illegal search and seizure could be admitted in court. And before that, apparently the rule was, sure, we don't care where it came from. Mm -hmm. And after that, nothing gets through the screen. And it's because there are unique things about the Vermont Constitution that are different from the federal constitution, and particularly as the federal courts begin to uh, perhaps withdraw from the uh, general fields of civil rights in particular, that in, in uh, Articles 10 and 11, and in uh, uh, maybe even Article 13, uh, which is our equivalent of the First Amendment, we're starting to see the Supreme Court recognize that there is something uh, special about Vermont. And, and so we've, we've made this big return, in a way, to it. And I've been reading, because I'm writing a book on the Vermont Constitution, I've been reading every court case that was ever mentioned in Vermont. And what I'm finding is that there is, a, not often successful, but that everybody seems to be wanting to push this and to get a little bit more of an advantage. And if you were trying to write a theoretical history of the court, I think you would have to uh, take, be able to wrap your arms around some of these massive changes. Um, I'm running out of time, and I, I want to leave some time for questions, but uh, I just want to say that the, um, the study of judicial history is something that's been ignored by Vermont historians for a long time, and if you take the classic histories, the Highland Halls and the, and the Thompsons and, the, and all of those, even the most recent one with Michael Sherman, you find very men little mention of the courts. You only, usually you only find a mention of uh, 
the Albany 1770 trial and the uh, Westminster Massacre, neither one of which was much to make Vermonters happy. And then <clears throat> maybe we, they, somebody throws in the last, the big ones, you know, the Brigham and Baker. Uh, and and that's, that's a shame because we have had a history of ignoring the court. Sam Hand, the late professor of history, used to illustrate this by saying, if you looked at the 1777 Constitution, Section 2 says, the supreme legislative power shall be the House of Representatives, because there was no Senate at the time. And, and two says, the supreme uh, executive power, I've got to go backwards, I guess, but the supreme executive power shall be the governor and council. In those days, he shared it with 12 others. And th then, what would you expect the next line to be? Courts of justice should be open in every county. Now, the 1974 amendments solved that problem by saying the supreme judicial uh, function should be the, the court. And from 1974 to 2000 and today, what you see is the set, the a satisfaction of having reached perhaps some kind of sense of control and organization where it's a unified court and where there isn't quite as much opportunity for infighting within the courts. Whereas if you were to look and trace the history of the architecture, if you will, of the, the organization of the Supreme Court. You see, first, we got three members, they're the whole judiciary. That's the Supreme Court. Then we get county courts. But we, and, we, then we, and we get the ju justice of the peace do some criminal things and some small civil things. And then we go along to 1824, a great year for judges who don't want to be in trial, because that's the last time that the court itself has to have a trial and hearings and all that. Uh, but, and then they try uh, splitting their time between the cases where they're going to hear the facts and the cases in which they're going to decide the, the, the law. This is like what they call the Isaac Prius process. And uh, that sounded like a great idea, but instead of one trip around the shires, they had to do a second one, and it started wearing them out. So went back to the normal process. People were complaining. It's you know, they didn't give it a chance. In 1850, they decided to cut the number of justices down to three and create four trial <coughs> judges. And that was really a good idea. Then the trials would be done by these other judges, and the others could, and the others could be appellate officers. And that only lasted five years, and then they said, oh, this is too complicated. We fell back on our things. So, so then five, five became six and six became seven. And I think of uh, that courthouse up in, Saint, in the North Hero and how seven justices ever sat behind that bench when it's only about eight feet long is a mystery to me. Uh, and then 1906, big change. We create the superior court. Superior judges hear the facts. We also have, but they do civil. And uh, so now we've got criminal is being done by Municipal judges who then are become district judges, and they're they're even paid less than the civil judges, <clears throat> and a lot less than the Supreme Court. And only by we by the time we get to the this century, does does every judge become a superior judge, and with uh, presumably with uh, with authority and with the credentials to be able to hear everything. So again, again the sweep of history suggests that we're going from <clears throat> a lot of experiments designed to make it more efficient. And I think we finally reached the point at least where we have intellectual and organizational control over the process. It's, uh, I don't know how it happens, I don't know how it works as well as it does. The amount of work that's available, uh, I, a couple of years ago I just looked at, at jury trials. Uh, I'd actually been called for jury duty, so I was, and I had never really done much in criminal court. But I was surprised to see that we had 7,000 misdemeanors and felonies each year. We had 7,000 filings in the civil court, all of which asked for a jury trial. And we have 147 jury trials a year. So something is going on here. We, we can't have that many jury trials because we don't have that many courthouses or judges or juries. Uh, but we, we still retain that. I was last. Two weeks ago, I was sitting waiting at the jury 
draw for to be drawn if possible and we sat there for two three hours and then the uh, judge came in and said well I know you're bored and uh, we probably are going to uh, take one jury trial this week but uh, but I want you to know that your sitting here has an incredible effect on those defendants they're they know you're in the building they know that they can you could be tried by them and and they're, they're left and right they're settling their cases because of this so then you look at the civil docket, and 90 some percent is settled by mediation or, uh, or motion. Uh, and uh, so you're, you're beginning to lose that sense of lawyers and judges as persons in a trial. You're beginning to see the law shifting away from direct encounters, and it's all becoming a sort of negotiation process. And, and where are the young lawyers going to learn the arts of cross examination? and of, uh, of oratory, if not in trials. And so what they learn is how to prepare a case, how to prepare a good complaint, and how to sit for endless depositions, something I do not miss, and file a motion and then wait. And once in a while, a judge will ask you to come in for oral argument, but that's about it. So it's, it's all a paper process. It's no longer a, an encounter process, and the law is, I think people will hate to hear this, but I think we mediate the best cases and they don't make it to the Supreme Court so we don't get the law and the regular refreshing re refreshment of new ideas. But I'm beginning to sound like I have an agenda here and all I ever wanted to do was to write a book like this and, the, and one of my ambitions was that it could sit on the shelf next to me and I use it all the time and I could look up to see you know, Milford Smith, what, who was he? And, oh yes, what has he done? <coughs> it, uh, it's not, uh, it's this generation's uh, history of the court, the next generation to be uh, come, I'm hoping. Uh, I am delighted to say that when I started 25 years ago writing about judicial history and legal history, I felt very alone. Russell Taft had been dead 100 years, and Frank Fish 75 years, and. And now, I have Jim Dunn, and I have Bob Mello, and Steve Martin, and Gary Shattuck, and a community of people who are beginning to write about this subject. And so, as I reach my retirement age, I don't feel as though this process is going to end like me and those uh, court officials who are wandering around in Washington in their uh, snowshoes uh, trying to find the court. <laughs> if you have questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yes? So you have this unique way of seeing the judiciary and history in Vermont because of all your research. And as an attorney, um, I wonder how this has colored your own experience. Do you see yourself as like playing this role um, as a, you know the current picture of what the judiciary is now? or? How, how does it, how has your knowledge and your research ex colored your experience as a lawyer? I had, uh, I was arguing before the Supreme Court one time and I was relying on an 1834 case and one of the justices said, Mr. Gillis, couldn't you find any earlier case to rely on? <laughs> so I've got a kind of reputation for being one that's in the back room looking through the cupboards. Uh, and I've also uh, tried to, uh, tried to litigate, uh, particularly in jury trials, as if it was 1890. Uh, and I'm not sure that went over very well either because nobody has the time for that anymore and judges are really like, uh, all right, settle down there, sir. Um, at the same time, I think it's given me a perspective on where we are from where we came from. And I, I, I see, we, we're certainly doing better. I mean, back in the, before 1850, we had a thing called review. You had a decision before a jury you didn't like it, you applied for a review and you got, next term, you got another fresh trial. Then you appeal to the Supreme Court, they could send it back, you could have another one. Sometimes there would be years before things were, were finished up. And uh, as I say, I'm not sure, I, I, I always thought that the person who can write a good motion is better off than the person who can make a good oral argument in some cases because the paper is what's the authoritative thing, but um, but I, I have to say I love reading Supreme Court. They, you know, there's so little on the justices. They're, they don't write their memoirs. They, the newspaper says they 
basically they reported when they were appointed and when they died. But the decisions of the Supreme Court are the richest source of stories about Vermonters that I've ever seen. And they're <coughs> undisguised, there, there's no secrets here. And if you can penetrate beyond the written decision and you can go, they, I don't know where they are, but they used to be all the briefs that were in the cellar of the state library. The state library is closed now. Uh, but you could read what the, what the lawyers were thinking about it, at least. And then in combination with uh, newspapers.com, sometimes you can piece together the story. But our history, you, can't, you can't have anything go on without knowing its history, and hopefully that, that's going in the right direction. Yes? So, Paul, in that vein, much as uh, Bob Mello did to elevate Moses Robinson into the public consciousness as one of the great founding fathers, are there three or five people you would pick out as great jurists that, that should be... I have to be careful because there's a justice here. So. Should, should, be known, you know, should be generally known. Well, I've always... I mean, my favorite just judge in the 19th century, let's say, is uh, Isaac uh, Fletcher uh, Redfield. And uh, his predecessor is Charles K. Williams. And between the two of them, if you just... You know, I used... They used to laugh at me at the office, but I would take a volume of early Vermont reports home and read it like a novel over the weekend. And, you know, some of it's pretty dry, but a lot of it is sparkling. These, these people knew how to write, and they wrote well. And, they, and the most important thing is they wrote in the first person. Singular. I think this. And, it, of course, it led to some bizarre things, like Redfield once tried a case, and then it was appealed to the Supreme Court, and there was no rule about how he couldn't participate. So he made right the majority decision, reversing his decision at trial, and then he wrote a dissent against the majority opinion. Now today that would never happen, but uh, that stuff's interesting to me, you know. <laughs> that, that tells me something about what's going Williams on. Williams has the biggest portrait in the state house, and I don't even think on the tour that he's identified as a judge. I had uh, the great thrill. Back, back 26 years ago, when I left state government and went to private practice, I was appalled to see that the office didn't have a complete set of Vermont reports. They started at 46 or something, you know, it was in 1946 and forward, and I said, I can't practice law without knowing the early cases. So. Uh, unfortunately, a young lawyer had passed away in St. Albans, and I was uh, assigned to drive up there and make a bargain for his complete library. And I did. And I got them back to the office, and we didn't have shelving at the time, so I just laid them all out like that. Just here I am, my whole, the whole thing up to down. And I pulled the first uh, volume up, and Charles K. Williams' name is written in the front. So I have his law library. And then his son was Charles L. Uh, uh, fixing it up. And he was, uh, and so that, he takes the set over and then somehow it ends up in our office. Now, as far as I know, nobody in my office has opened one of those books in the last five years or 10 years because we use Westlaw all the time. But it's a secure feeling to know that they're there. So one day I said to my partner, he said, well, who is this guy, Charles K. Williams? And I said, oh, he's the biggest portrait in the governor's office. Let's go up there. We went up there. He's holding volume one in his hand, the book I have in my library. So there's a certain circularity here. That you can't, how could I not be a judicial historian given those kinds of things? So, yes, sir. I think I heard you say that today, approximately 90% of the cases in the court, in the civil are, court. In the, are settled through mediation rather than through the court. That's right. And one of the things you didn't like about that was attorneys never got a chance to try it in court. But do you think that the justice that was handed out in those decisions was still perhaps as good as it had been through the court? I have sat through hundreds, it seems like, dozens anyway, of mediations, and I can say that for the most part, the, the results have been good for everybody. Uh, in fact, you can't really settle something unless it's good for everybody. It's somehow it's got to be, seem to be accepted as fair. We have developed an extraordinary set of very professional mediators who are not condescending, but are actually very good about making that case. So I'm, I can't say that justice is 
put off from that. But if justice is defined largely as a system of decision making that's going to evolve over time, you know, the court gets a piece of paper saying they settled, or maybe it gets a settlement agreement that, you, that this court has to sign off on. And I mean, I'm, I live in a very unique area of law with rights of way and town boundaries and property boundaries and old roads. And those are the cases that settle out that, that is it possible that the law of old roads would be stunted because everyone's going to be settling from now on because the cost of litigation is too expensive because by the time you get to mediation three years in the client is completely exhausted stressed and blaming you for not having brought home the bacon so far so i, I don't i can't condemn it it's just that it's, it's a really uh it's a conundrum, I guess, you know. And, and so maybe, maybe my profession is obsolete or obsolescent in a way. Maybe we'll make our arguments before the Development Review Board and the Select Board instead of the courts. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. you. You practice only civil law, I guess. Yes. Yeah. I just finished reading a book called Charged uh, about uh, basically how most criminal cases are settled by plea bargains now, and it was lamenting it because so many people are being forced by mandatory minimum sentences to take a plea bargain even if they're innocent, uh, out of fear of what's going to happen to them. Do you have any comment on that kind of <coughs> Well, I, I'm not the right one to talk about the criminal law because my only experience has been serving as a juror on one case. And uh, as disappointed as I was, the practice in that court was that they would seat 14, and then the judge took out this little can and shook it and called out two names that were alternates that were then excused before deliberation, and one, I was one of them. So I, I, was, I just wanted to see what deliberation would be like. I, all I knew was, you know, seven, uh, 12 angry men, which I'd seen a couple of times. But I, no, I, uh, it's certainly true. Uh, now, I've been reading recreationally the opinions of the Attorney General from the last century. And uh, I just this morning looked at a, a report from Alvin J. Parker, Jr., who was Attorney General in, I guess, the 1940s. And he reported to the Supreme Court that 78% of all defendants who have been uh, indicted or charged with crimes have been declared, have been found guilty in the courts. And that's 1935. That, I don't know, I, I, I'm suspicious of that if that's the case today because I know there's a, a great, much greater interest. And you know, the <clears throat> criminal laws changed. I mean, it was just pointed out to me that it wasn't until like, I think 93 when the defense counsel could conduct depositions of the witnesses for the state. And so there was this sort of second class thing that went on. And uh, Steve Martin's wonderful book on called Orville's Re Revenge, which is about the uh, lawsuits that went around the, uh, uh, the unfortunate murder of Orville Gibson in the late 50s. Uh, he, he says that uh, discovery was not allowed. It wasn't, there was no allowance for that. And so he was sitting next to a great lawyer, Dick Davis, during the trial, and Dick would turn to him and say, get me a witness that'll say this, and he'd leave the courtroom, drive up and down the street, and try to find somebody to bring them in. There was no preparation for that. It was all done. They, had, they were talking to coroners who were in Boston. They would leave Chelsea at 5 o'clock when the court closed, drive to Boston before interstate, meet with the coroners overnight, and then drive back in time for the court to begin the next day. That's, that's a more rigorous approach to the practice of law than even the overstressed lawyers in my office are. So. I think I'm running out of time, but I think yeah. one more question. You, you mentioned that they allowed the Indians to make their own decisions historically. Um, has that weighed in the Abenaki claims for sovereignty and recognition? Uh, that historically, they were allowed to make decisions on their own as a... I don't know. There, there's a classic decision by Justice Mahady about this, and mm -hmm. uh, one earlier, but uh, I don't think that carries a lot of weight. There has more to do with uh, 
the, their history than their independent. Were there any other ethnic group that they allowed them to make decisions on their own? Well, I don't know anybody else who got <laughs> slaughtered in the waiting room of a courthouse, but. And, and that's the only case I know of this, and it's so, it stands out so starkly against the rest of it, they can't leave it out of the book. You know? How is the street, uh, Supreme Court um, filled now? By appointment of the governor from a list provided by the Judicial Nominating Committee. And that's been the case since 1974. Although before that, when a judge retired or died in midterm, the governor would appoint a replacement and then almost always that person, well always, that person would then be elected by the legislature. Can a lawyer self-refer? You mean can I nominate myself? Yeah. I guess so. He's a little bit, uh, I don't think you'd be welcomed in that, you know, but you're supposed to be, you know, modest and self-effacing. <laughs> in this area. <laughs> I'm sure that <laughs> Paul will answer more questions afterwards, but I think it's time that we sort of round up here. I know that John has some um, notices to give us yeah. before we go. And um, I just want to point out that we do have some uh, forms to fill out if you're interested in membership, if you haven't done that already. But whoops, I'll just throw them around. <laughs> <laughs> They're out on the table. <laughs> well, let's first acknowledge Paul's presentation. Uh, <laughs> a couple of announcements. Uh, our next talk will be June 23rd, and Will Randall will, will be returning with the topic Hamilton, the Man, the Musical, and his friend Ethan Allen. So if you've heard him before, I think he has uh, kind of added to this talk that he's done previously, uh, and that'll be part of our Ethan Allen Day uh, commemoration on that weekend of June 23rd. July 1st, we will have a group of musicians from the 40th Army Band here, and that's going to be at Monday night at 7 p.m. You'll get more information. There'll be some other activities taking place at that time also. All right, so those are the two announcements. Tom, you mentioned about the fact that if anyone would like to get Paul's book, we sold out. We're sold out. But we're we sold out. But this is I the man to stay. He'll take your name. I'll take your name, and I will make sure that you get a book if you would like to do that. Okay. So. And I'm the volunteer coordinator here at the homestead, and we need new volunteers. We don't have enough volunteers. We need readers, and we need dozens. If you have spare time, you want to you want to greet people here, meet people from all over the world, learn about history. Talk to me, and I'll get you a volunteer position. You can fill out an application, and we'll get you working tomorrow. <laughs> all right, thank you all for coming. Thanks. Thank you.